Um, so hello to everybody. This is the second time that we are having this meeting. Maybe people will be joining later and that's completely okay. Some people told me that they will be joining later because it was a little bit uh, too early for them, but they will try <laughs> later. Um, so the idea of this anonymous credentials meeting is to have an informal place to discuss about our interest in anonymous credentials uh, from a theoretical, from an implementation, from a um, deployment perspective, uh, from a standardization perspective. Um, so basically that's what we have in this meeting. On the first one, it was really interesting because there was a lot of discussion about um, creating a good place where one can find different kinds of anonymous credentials that exist, the different primitives that could be used for it, the different properties that they give, the different schemes that they give. Um, and we kind of took that action item and created something. There were some people also asking, what about adding post quantum to anonymous credentials or to the primitives that underline anonymous credentials? And as we have today, I'll talk about that. And of course, there was also the talking about uh, how do you actually add metadata to anonymous credentials? And we have kind of two mechanisms today for that. And something that at least I'm personally interested in, and that's one of the reasons why we have also the talk from Tian, is what other applications that are anonymous credentials, um, because um, beyond only using privacy paths, <laughs> uh, what other kind of applications you can have of the protocols itself. Um, that's from my side. Um, I don't know if Steven, this time we have actually uh, organized also with Steven because the idea is to rotate this organization process. So it becomes more like an actual kind of conference like instead of like just some random thing. Um, so this time we also organize it with Steven. I don't know if Steven, you want to say something or anything. <laughs> uh, don't have really much to add, much to add there. Hopefully we'll continue to like have these as like regular every like six months or so at various conferences, just so that we could keep on keeping in touch and seeing what the state of the art is. Yes, <laughs> thank you, Steve. Um, just for your information, this um, this uh, meeting also fo always follows the SNAP, SNALP um, guidelines. So in case you see something that you don't like, also let us know and we will try to handle it. But I hope that doesn't happen. Um, yeah, and today we have basically four presentations. At the beginning, there was a idea to have two more, but one of them, <laughs> one of the presenters told me that they couldn't make it today and they would like to join in the next one. And then the other one is was a proposal that it wasn't fully fleshed out, um, but I hope that for the next one, it is actually fully fleshed out. Um, yes, so today we have a lineup of four speakers and the first one is Alex. And Alex is a researcher currently working at cryptography uh, at Brave, and he has done a really amazing job around anonymous credentials. Uh, he's one of the first authors of the privacy pass protocol. Uh, right now, he's, I think he's also really interested in BOPRFs and post quantum from his latest research or what I've seen. And he will be talking today about that. So how the format works is that the presenter will present, there will be a time for questions. And later, after all of the presentation, we will have um, our socializing time, if you want to call it that way. So you go for it, Alex, and thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Can you hear me okay? And can you see my slides? Yes, I can see the slides as well. Cool. Uh, yeah, thank you for the introduction. So uh, I'm Alex, and I'm going to be talking about some joint work uh, with Martin Albrecht, Amit Dio, and Nigel Smart, which we presented at uh, PKC earlier this year. And it's um, kind of around uh, these VOPRF protocols or verifiable oblivious pseudo random functions and how we might build them in a post quantum setting. And in this work, we focused on, uh, you know, building these things from lattice based primitives. So briefly on how like a, a VOPRF protocol is structured. So we have a client which has an input X and we have a server with an input key K. And essentially the client wants to evaluate the like this pseudo random function um, on its input X that the server has a key to. So essentially what's going to happen is the client server going to communicate with each other and uh, the client's going to eventually learn a pseudo random function evaluation on K and X. So the properties of the protocol are that the server learns nothing about the client's input X and that likewise the client learns nothing about the server's key K. So that's kind of like how you build like an oblivious pseudo random function. And then the verifiability pro uh, like property 
ensures that the server must also prove that the output uh, of the protocol was evaluated using K, because obviously this thing kind of looks pseudo random. Uh, so this verifiability property ensures that the server doesn't just send like a random value, they are actually evaluating the pseudo random function. And essentially, um, relating these uh, like kind of protocols to anonymous credentials, you can kind of think of this pair X and the pseudo random function evaluation as like a one bit anonymous credential, whereby if the client at some point opens this pair, so it reveals its original input X and this uh, PRF um, output, um, it proves that at some point the client uh, received this pseudo random function evaluation from the server because the server only is the only party with that key K. So in terms of like how uh, we use those one bit um, credentials, essentially like these uh, VOPRFs built in a, or either verifiable or just a standard OPRFs uh, built in like classical prime order groups are um, quite well used building blocks in like internet protocols. Um, a few different protocols are actually going through standardization with the Internet Engineering Task Force. So uh, one of these is the Privacy Class Protocol. And essentially this just uses this one bit anonymous credential in just exactly the way uh, that I described. And essentially, if you couple this uh, credential with some sort of challenge mechanism, like compute, uh, uh, solving some humanity test or like, um, you know, solving some like anti-fraud kind of test or something like that, then uh, by then um, you can receive these like pseudo random function valuations and then open them in the future um, without having to redo that challenge over and over again. And without also um, linking back this um, credential back to a previous issuance step. So you have this like unlinkable or private authorization uh, protocol. And then another protocol which is uh, being standardized, which kind of uses uh, Oblivious pseudo random functions as like an internal building block is the um, opaque password authenticated key exchange, um, which allows people to, you know, like build like login style protocols with usernames and passwords in a more secure way than standard constructions. So in terms of obviously we can build these things in classical groups, but one of the things that um, we couldn't do prior to this work was build these things in a post quantum world where you have quantum adversaries that can break uh, classical um, hardness assumptions. So in this work, we kind of, you know, tried to tackle um, this problem. And essentially what we, all we wanted to do was build uh, a VOPRF protocol, but from some post quantum hardness assumptions. So we went um, with lattices because that's kind of where the expertise of the authors lay. And in terms of contributions, we kind of did this uh, based on um, idea, like based in ideal lattices and we security also holds in this like quantum random Oracle model. Um, but what I should emphasize before I get started is this is entirely like a feasibility result. Um, so this is like, you know, theoretical in its design and, and you wouldn't really implement um, this protocol. And I'll go into the details of why uh, you would do that, but it's kind of inherent to uh, the problems with building things from lattices, um, essentially. So in terms of how we actually build these VOPRFs in a classical setting, uh, we have this offline online phase. So in the offline phase, you have a server uh, it has a key K and it kind of commits to it. And those, that commitment is shared with all the clients in the system. Essentially this commitment is just like um, a generator for the prime order group raised to the power of the service key K. And then in the online phase, what the client wants to do is learn this pseudo random function evaluation. So first it has this input X and it has the server's commitment C and it hashes X to the group. And then it uh, needs to blind X. So essentially what it does is it multiplies this X with this blinding factor, which is G to the power of R. And it sends that to the server. And the nature of this blinding is that the server can't actually read X in this message, but it gets this Y, which is a multiplication of the two things. And then in the, the server side, it just raises what the client sends it to the power of K. And it proves in zero knowledge, uh, essentially that Z, Y, the discrete log relationship between Y and Z is shared between, is the same as the discrete log relationship between the commitment C and the generator G. And you can build these proofs from like really like standard, like Schnorr type arguments. So it sends that back to the client and the client verifies the proof uh, to get verifiability and then essentially unblinds by using the service commitment C raised to the power of the inverted form of this blinding scalar that it generated in the, in the initial step of the online phase. And so the algebra here kind of works out in the sense that the client, this isn't exactly what the PRF output is, but essentially this all rests upon the fact that the client eventually outputs something which is like X raised to the power of K. Um, so the service key K is protected in the sense that it's like a discrete log exponent. So you can base this on like a hardness of discrete log type assumptions. And the, uh, the client's input uh, X is kind of like blinded in the 
uh, the server in the message to the server. So the server never learns that. So in terms of um, what we like, the starting point for our work is that actually you can build like discrete log uh, type analog um, assumptions um, around like these learning with errors type um, hardness uh, problems that are common in like lattice based uh, cryptography. So essentially, if we think of like the discrete log relationship as like you have the secret K and then you have G and you raise G to the power of K and then you're hiding K, then the, lati the lattice analog or like, I'm specifically going to focus on the ring learning with errors problem here. So you have this like ring, and, which is a, um, analogous to like an ideal lattice. Then you have the secret S, which is some ring element. And you have this error distribution associated with the ring and you sample a random error from that. And then you can construct like a ring LWE sample with this like public A, which is just random element in the ring. And then you do AS plus E and this AS plus E is kind of randomly distributed. Um, and that's like the hardness assumption underpinning like the ring LWE problem. And so our idea is essentially just like, can you build a natural post-quantum VOPF using this analog? And the answer is yes, in short, and I'll kind of go into more details now, but I, I, so I just kind of want to give some more ideas about the structure of this ring, but I think it'd probably be best to read the paper if you want to know more about the ring and kind of the internals in this system. But essentially this ring is just like a really standard um, ring that's used in like typical ring LWE, uh, like cryptography. So we have this like cyclotomic ring with degree N, which is like a power two. And then we have this like modulus Q and this Q is quite large in our system, which is kind of one of the inherent inefficiencies. And we have this also this modulus P, which is smaller than Q and is used for rounding to get like a deterministic output because uh, we introduce these errors and obviously then getting deterministic uh, like pseudo random output is difficult once you introduce errors. And then the key to the like, like this security argument is we need these like well-structured um, error distributions. So firstly, we have this error distribution in violet, which is essentially the key space parameterized by this parameter sigma and it's discrete Gaussian. Um, and then we have this other error distribution in green, which is parameterized by sigma prime and sigma prime is chosen much larger than sigma. And essentially the idea is that any sample from the green error distribution when added to a sample from the other error distributions is going to like drown it. And this property is known as noise drowning. What this means is that all errors, if you add these errors together, it's essentially gonna look the same. It's gonna be distributed the same as just sampling an error from the green distribution. And then internally we use um, the pseudo-random function of Banerjee Piker, uh, which is a ring LWE based PRF. And we use these zero knowledge proofs um, from recent uh, works, which essentially are just like compatible with uh, lattice-based pseudo-random function evaluations. Um, again, I'm not going to talk about these in detail, but they are quantum random oracle model compatible. So in terms of the offline phase, um, one thing I'm going to emphasize here is that it does look really similar to the classical um, system, except the only difference is that we require zero knowledge proofs in all the steps, uh, which is another inherent uh, source of inefficiency. And I'm going to assume as well that the the zero knowledge proofs are being verified at all times here. So, so the commitment uh, C is essentially the ring LWE analog of the classical um, uh, classical commitment. So we have this K as the ring LWE secret, and then you just build the ring LWE sample using that. And then in the online phase, instead of using this hash to group, we have this like pseudo random function, which we put X into the client input and we get this AX, which is a ring element associated with it. So this is again, kind of analogous. And the blinding factor is now this ring L degree sample AS plus E1, where S is this randomly sampled ring element. And that's kind of like the R in the classical system. So there's the proof and um, send that to the server. And the server essentially just multiplies whatever the client sends it by the key K once the proof is verified, and then adds on this error from the bigger, wider error distribution. Um, and this is DX and sends this back to the client. And without going through all the algebra, essentially what the client does is like unblind this DX and then round it with respect to this modulus P. And the idea with um, this rounding is that because you end up with AX multiplied by K, which is going to be like the eventual PRF output, kind of like X to the power of K in the classical setting. And then you add on all these small error terms, but we set up all the parameters such that with this rounding P, you're very likely to round off all the small error terms and just end up with something that's like equal to uh, AX multiplied by K rounded with respect to this modulus P. So in terms of correctness, um, essentially we're gonna have a problem if this error term comes close to a rounding boundary because then we're gonna round to something that's not A, it's multiplied by K. And we show that um, because of the sizes of all the error distributions, we can bound this error term within this like minus T to T boundary. 
And then our correctness argument is actually computational in the sense that we rely on the hardness of one dimensional short integer solution problem, which is like a well-known, um, well, it's a, a problem that's thought, thought to be hard in like the ideal lattice setting for the, the parameters that we choose. And essentially what we show is if you could, if, if we get a correctness error, it amounts to breaking the 1D SCIS problem, which is um, to where we derive hardness in terms of correctness. And then in terms of actual security uh, against malicious adversaries, we, it kind of holds again via similar arguments via 1D SAS. And we also rely on the uniformity of ring LWE samples, because you may have noticed that all the messages essentially just are ring LWE samples. So they're all randomly distributed in the ring. So we can kind of replace these with uniform values and while simulating all the zero knowledge proofs using the zero knowledge property. So that's kind of correctness and security. And then in terms of, I know I'm running over here, so I'll try and speed up, but um, in terms of uh, why this kind of construction is, is inefficient, like the two things to look at are the Q and the Sigma prime. So we have to choose Sigma prime much bigger than Sigma in order to get this noise drowning property, which means that we have to choose a super polynomial, uh, yeah, super polynomial um, like standard deviation parameter um, in, in the security parameter. And then we also have Q has to be very large because of this Banerjee Pike at PRF uh, that we use as well for the security proof for that. So these end up being very large. And if we look at the concrete costs, this like uh, Yaraki, Kiyas and Kravshik construction, which is the classical construction I kind of went through, you have like concrete costs in the order of bytes for communication. Uh, in terms of our protocol, and then I've also highlighted this Bonet et al. isogeny based oblivious pseudorandom function, we see like concrete costs of megabytes and for our construction it's actually worse because the megabytes corresponds to just like the ring elements that we send and that's not taken into account the size of the zero knowledge proofs uh, which could be very large if you use like lattice based proofs if you use something like snarks you might be able to get this down smaller but the the key thing to remember here is that these things are wildly more inefficient than the classical constructions currently so in terms of like just finishing up like again i just want to emphasize that we We've shown that we can build these things uh, from lattice-based hard problems, but you're going to suffer expensive costs. And that's the case for the isogeny-based proposals as well. And there's also some recent cryptanalysis of the uh, isogeny-based proposals, sp uh, specifically for SIDH-based uh, protocols, which means that they're like the parameter settings that they quote are also probably going to have to be increased in order to maintain security. And so the expensive costs kind of come from uh, you know, the zero knowledge proofs. Uh, that we use the noise drowning and also this like underlying pseudo random function so in terms of future work where i think would be most valuable in trying to get like a post quantum via prf protocol i think you know either removing or reducing the impact of all of these things is going to be crucial here um and so going looking into more of those things i think will be valuable for this research and i think it would also have an impact for other like lattice based you know trying to develop more practical lattice based equivalents of uh, classical protocols and then finally, you could also build like um, post quantum BOPRFs using like more generic methods from like garbled circuits or fully homomorphic encryption. And doing like a detailed comparison of our protocol with those kind of designs would be also quite interesting, I think. But um, that's everything. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. That's a really interesting area of research. Um, the people of, oh, the clubs now show here. Okay, yes. <laughs> um, do people have questions for Alex? kind of five minutes okay someone raise hand who oh, martin martin uh first of all thanks um second this night noise drowning it sort of sounds like what they did in bv bgv with homomorphic encryption very early on and that was then circumvented with these uh rinse cycles and then these uh randomized gadget matrices in PSW. So without having read your paper and knowing this very well, that could perhaps be an interesting avenue to explore. Yeah, possibly. I have to admit, I'm not like very well versed on the FHE literature. I know that these noise drowning approaches have been used in other different like kind of works around like proxy re-encryption and um, limited forms of obfuscation and that's kind of where we I mean we were kind of like trying to like I said build a feasibility result here so we weren't too worried about efficiency when we were building this so there may well be easy ways of kind of getting around these things um I think it's kind of a matter of seeing whether they like pair up nicely with improve because all of these things like cause and if you don't get rid of all the 
zero knowledge proofs the underlying PRF and the noise drowning that one of them is going to cause inefficiency problems. And so trying to get, you know, improve all of these things whilst maintaining like for correctness and security and things like that is kind of the key. But um, you, you may well be right. There may well be, um, you know, natural ways of kind of avoiding these approaches. So first, Michelle asked in the chat, can you go back to the slide of the protocol? <laughs> um, do you want to ask something, Michelle? Uh, no, not really. Just to uh, to look at it a bit okay. more closely. And yeah, thanks for the talk. <laughs> no problem. Um, Tiran, I see that you have your hand up. Uh, yeah, so it's more two two small comments really. So the isogeny one, I think the the commitment scheme they use was broken. So I think it's more than just adjusting the parameters. Mm -hmm. So I think this is currently the only uh, secure construction, at least in theory. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to noise drowning, um, I I think the problem here is that you multiply two short things. So you need to drown it. Uh, we have the same problems with like distributed decryption and so on for lattices, where you you don't seem to be able to come around this point because you need short and short and if you then reveal it then then it's possible to do some kind of analysis attacks and um, you cannot get the good basis out of it so i think that's inherent in this problem yeah yeah exactly um i mean uh that's exactly it. if you look at the slide here you can see that the key the server key is kind of encoded into the error term and so we really have to like hide that um and that's essentially why we went down this noise drowning approach is, but um, you know, this, this isn't necessarily the best way of constructing the, these type of protocols in the lattice world as well. We were just kind of trying to go like the natural transformation from classical kind of assumptions to lattice based assumptions, but there may be a better way of building these things from like LWE or ring LWE that doesn't kind of look like classical construction. So that would be another way, I guess. And I think if you if you get around this noise drowning, you will also improve a lot of other protocols that are kind of waiting for a breakthrough mm -hmm. right here. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, I had a small question, Alice. So you were um, equalizing this problem to the short integer solution problem in one dimension only. So only in one dimension. Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just one dimension because essentially we only care about one coefficient of the ring elements going if one coefficient goes wrong then okay. you will have a correctness error so you can kind of reduce everything down to just looking at this kind of like one coefficient thing and then you can reapply the argument multiple times um so that's kind of the way we went mm. down it. okay interesting okay <laughs> um any other question or comment for alex Okay, I guess no. And with that, thank you very much, Alex. Really interesting. Please read his paper. It's also on the website. So you want to read his paper for you. Okay, so the next person that I have in mind is uh, Tihan Silde, who is a PhD student at Trudheim Nuwe. I hope that I pronounced that correctly. And <laughs> he's very interesting in these fan cryptographic areas, but one of the most interesting things that, at least for me, he has been working recently is how to apply anonymous credentials into different types of new applications. And one of them is, of course, contact tracing. So today he will be speaking about how to apply anonymous credentials to contact tracing. So you go for it, um, Tira. Thank you. Thank you for organizing and thank you for inviting me. Um, so I'm going to talk about two applications. There's basically no crypto in my in my talk, but I'll just talk about how we basically use the protocol Alex described with in the discrete log setting in uh, in two systems. One is in production, and one is uh, uh, early stage playing around with, I guess. Um, <clears throat> So this is uh, based on joint work with Henrik Wokemo, who is a consultant at the Beck, and uh, Martin Strand, who is a researcher at the um, Norwegian Defense Research Establishment. And he's also in the group here, so he's happy to, we're all, both of us happy to answer questions both uh, under the talk and afterwards and Zulip and an email and whatever you prefer to, to use. Um, so I'm going to go through a few points. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about digital contract tracing, which is uh, uh, very relevant for the time we're in right now and been uh, been developed a lot of uh, apps around the world um, recently. And I'm going to talk about uh, 
the Smith to stop contact tracing app that we used and built in Norway. Um, Smith to stop basically means infection stop. And then uh, um, a few words about the ongoing research and the tickets, um, anonymous tickets that we're working on right now. <clears throat> um, so just for context, so in, in our case, the, the Norwegian Institute of Public Health developed an app to supplement traditional contact tracing. So the point is that, well, you do the manual as well, where you try to ask people where, who tested positive and ask like who you've been in touch with and where you've been and, and then try to call everyone. But there might be people that you, you miss, for example, if you're next to them in the store or by the bus, so you forget about them or uh, you know, young people not, doesn't necessarily answer the phone if a known number is called and so on. So we, it's kind of a supplement to try to reach out to everyone and, and, and help uh, that process and make it easier. <clears throat> and um, yeah, so it's an app that you can install and then it, it gives you a notification if you've been close to someone who have reported a positive test. And uh, this app is built on the Apple Google system that uh, they published a year ago. Um, so basically to, to give you like the, the overall um, um, yeah, features basically, um, everything is local on the phone. So there's no like central database uh, storing uh, all kind of data, but it's on the phone and you can install the app. You don't need to register or anything like this. It uses Bluetooth. So when people meet, I'll show you in a minute, um, they exchange some, some codes and then you can uh, see like who you've been close to, but there's no GPS. So it's only like people you've physically been, been close to. And we hope that there's a correlation between being close and being infected, or at least that's something we should try to uh, be aware of. And you only identify yourself. Um, this varies from countries to countries, but you only identify yourself when you report on a positive test. So there's, there's no personal data until you get to the point where you actually have tested positive. And then you upload what we call infection keys to a server. And uh, then uh, the server just shares these keys. And if you've seen one of them before, then you, you are being close to someone. So <clears throat> how does it actually look if we look at figures? So if uh, two people meet, they have the app installed, they uh, exchange these keys, which is basically just uh, random noise. Um, that you, you, you remember what you've seen. So people, people meet and, and the phone store these codes. And then if, um, if the person on the left is gonna then, uh, he tests positive and he's gonna report that. And then he identifies himself, himself to uh, some kind of verification service. And in our way, we have a centralized system for uh, tests. So there's like one place where they know everyone who had tested positive and not. In different countries, it's more local. So for example, in Switzerland, it's the doctor. So if you want to report uh, in the app, then the doctor kind of gives you a verification code back over the phone that you can paste into the phone and then it will do the same uh, from there on on. But in Norway, we can do this automatically by identifying yourself uh, through an identification portal where you can log in. <clears throat> and then you get a a certificate basically saying like, yes, this person has tested positive. It's really important that people can't just uh, uh, fake this because then you can uh, basically attack the system and make everyone you meet ever um, having to test and quarantine and, and whatever the, the recommendations are. And then you um, send this certificate to get the video keys to a backend service. And the backend service check that the certificate is valid. And if it is, then it shares these infection keys with all the other users in the system and they can check locally if they've seen these keys before. And if they have, then they should maybe quarantine, maybe get a test, um, whatever is reasonable to do in that situation. And the problem here is like, you want privacy for the users. Um, so you don't want to be able to track them, for example, where they've been or who they met and so on. And and you can think of like, okay, you identify to one server and you upload keys to another. So maybe it's, there's no connection, but the problem here is the certificate itself. Uh, especially if the verification service and the backend service work together, they can know who, who they issued a certificate to and who uh, reported it with their keys later on. And uh, at least in a Norwegian setting, this, uh, these two servers are run by the same organization. So by definition, they, they know this. <clears throat> And um, so this is where we used privacy pass basically. 
So it's, it's, it's kind of just direct application of it where you, you identify yourself and then you get a token back and then you randomize it like in the privacy pass protocol and then you upload this, this token uh, to the backend server afterwards. And at least uh, just looking at the information being sent, there's no correlation here between the ID and the infection keys. Um, you can think of like situation where there's like public um, <clears throat> public sensors that uh, kind of record these kind of keys that you send out automatically and then you compare later. Or if if you get hold of one phone, you can check if they've been in touch with another person just because their phones have been close to each other and so on. So you, you want to kind of avoid all these, these situations. Um, so there's still some problems and, and, and these kind of uh, inspired our, our continued work in this area. So one thing is that um, if, you, if a user get a token, he should not be able to like wait, up, wait out. So if he, if he gets sick, he quarantine, he get uh, better again after a few weeks and then he go out to meet people. He should not be able to then upload the keys with the people he met after he was uh, well again. So we need to kind of make sure that this, this token is used in a limited time period. And in this case, uh, the way we do it is just revoke all unspent tokens by rotating the key material. And this is done every three days. And you have a public API where you can download a new, new public keys that is used for signing. So you kind of need this uh, kind of security by gossip uh, basically where you, you you need to make sure that there's the same keys available to everyone and so on so it's it's not a perfect uh, system but it's at uh, least one solution and it's one we try to solve afterwards um, you also need the signer and the verifier to share key material um, in our case it's two servers but it's owned by the same organization but you still need to kind of share this material between the servers and uh, and the way we did that was just uh, share a seed in the start, and then you generate the new new keys based on time and the seed over time. So then you get like a new key every three days or something. Um, a last problem that we we didn't solve. So uh, so this is kind of still an issue with us. So this is not like a, a perfect private protocol, but it's it's improvement of what was uh, at the time. But um, if you look at, for example, IP addresses. It will most likely be the same IP address if you're on your home Wi-Fi or something that uh, both get a certificate and uploads afterwards. Um, <clears throat> we played around with the ideas, but uh, it's kind of hard to, to avoid unless you use Tor or like building Tor into the contract tracing app, which would be fun, but I don't think that was uh, realistic, at least not uh, at the moment. Um, if you're on your phone and you're like not using Wi-Fi but roaming, then you cannot change IP addresses uh, pretty frequently. Um, so that could be a solution, but then you need some kind of delay. And, and, and also if you only look at the timestamps, that might be even more revealing if you first contact the one server and then the other one. Um, so unless you, you're able to add a lot of dummy data in the system, for example, every, all the apps contact the servers with regular time intervals just to create some some dummy data and, and so on, but I think that's really hard just because the, the servers are controlled by the same identity. So then you would, again, uh, you would have some delay put into the system, but then suddenly the user turns off his phone and then it didn't upload after all. And it, it's kind of um, issues there that seemed hard to solve uh, at the time. And, and the, the kind of the security we have is that all the code is open source and we kind of need to make sure that well, this is the, actually the code running and, and everything, but it's it's hard to be, be certain. But the, the security you get at least is that there's no data in a database that kind of connects these things. And if you didn't store this at the time of upload, it's impossible to go back in time. That's kind of guaranteed by the security of the privacy pass protocol that all the data stored is kind of secure. So you can, for example, if you change regulations that some countries did after forcing everyone to use it, then they change regulations. And so that at least they, they can not go back in time and, and track this and so on. Um, but this is something we, we would like to, to solve as well, but it seems like an um, engineering problem or an architecture problem, not um, cryptography itself. <clears throat> and it's also worth mentioning, we, we 
we got an award for this work actually. It was the, the Norwegian Data Protection Authority had a built-in privacy um, competition. And so, so we got the, the award. We won the competition and we got an award for, for in, integrating this, which were done uh, last winter. And uh, partially because of the improvement of this protocol, um, the contact tracing protocol, but also because of ideas we had for like further work in, in other areas this can be used. So we hope to see more adoption. And, and one of the ideas we presented was uh, uh, tickets, so you can, how you can travel. So this uh, ongoing research, um, together with Martin Stan, we designed a uh, new um, this token protocol, which is basically an extension of the privacy pass protocol with the public metadata and public verifiability, if you want. So there's different variation of it. There's also private metadata uh, into it. Um, if you want public verification, then you need to use pairings, at least as far as we, we managed. But uh, you can get public metadata without pairings, just normal elliptic curve control um, and so on. I'm not really going to go into details because Nirvan will talk more about this in the next, next talk. Um, but uh, at least we're playing around with this and there's a proof of concept that's currently being implemented now by some students uh, working with Martin this summer. And there's a paper available at, at uh, ePrint if you want to look into the details. Um, we're going to update this ePrint. This was published uh, or we put it out uh, maybe half a year ago. So there, there's some changes in the meantime. Um, so it will be updated um, soon. But um, yeah. And uh, the idea here with tickets um, was that if you have a ticket, uh, like a, um, a car that you can use, for example, in a month or a week or something, and you traveling with a bus, and if you need to check in and check out with the card every time you go on and off the bus, it's, uh, and it's connected to one card, which is again tied to your identity, it's really easy to, to track every movement you do, right? You, you go from your home to your bus and you go to work and you go to school or you, you go to different kind of events or whatever. Um, so it's really easy to find out who's doing this if you just store all the data. So the idea here is that you can use a one-time token every time you go on a bus so that they only get, the, the, they get all the traffic patterns and all the information that they want to, to make sure that there is capacity in the system basically, and they want to learn about the traffic patterns, but they don't know anything about you, just that someone did this single trip and someone did this under other single trip without being able to connect them. And to make sure that they have like valid tickets for the time period they're going, they can then use public metadata into the tokens that they get. So for example, every token, if you have a, a ticket for a month, you, you might get one token for each day Right? And then you won't be able to see the difference between a, a single ticket or a month card or a week or whatever you have. And this is also currently being worked on by students working at Entur, which is a, a bus and train company ticket uh, system in Norway and Beck, the consulting company uh, that Henrik works for. So this is also being tested out right now and we'll see, I'm really, really excited to see where this is leading afterwards. Um, some resources, if you're interested, I'll, I'll share my slides so you can check it out. But we have our library, we have documentation for it, and we've written down what I've been talking about now in different blog posts, if you're interested to, to learn more. And yeah, we're happy to, to answer any questions you have, and, and feel free to reach out to us afterwards if you have more that we, we didn't cover now. Thanks. Thank you very much, Jan. That was really amazing. Um, and thank you for all your work. Um, does anybody have any question for Tihan or Martin? Can I ask one? Um, okay, yes. <laughs> so, um, is the version implemented in the contact tracing app also including the public metadata type? Uh, no. No, no. So that was work we did afterwards. So uh, that the kind of the problems that we, we solved came up while working on the integration with the contact tracing app. But right now it's just the, the same problems that we had with rotating keys and, uh, and shared data. Yeah. Can, can I ask further? So you mentioned there's like a gossip style 
um, integrity check for the server keys. How does that actually work? Like, what do the clients communicate with each other? Right. So, and there's, there's not a system for that. It's more like there's a open API that everyone can go to and check the, the keys. Uh, so you can check from your laptop, your phone, you can check with your friends if you like don't trust the system. So you can see that you have the same keys, but there's not like a integrated into the app that you can communicate with other to verify. That's not a, not a part of it, no. Okay, cool. Thanks. I, I think this sort of adds to the, to the greater uh, system here. So uh, these guys at the Public Health Institute uh, said, okay, uh, you, we can accept these pull requests on this uh, fancy schmancy crypto you've got. Uh, but we have to make sure that this thing just works. So as cryptographers, we wouldn't be pleased with much of it because, well, we can find an attack but availability was their primary concern above everything else. And, and that was a very useful lesson for me, at least. Uh, on the other hand, we were able to teach them a thing or two about viewing uh, themselves as a threat actor. So we, we can usually model security as viewing everybody else as as the adversary. And then privacy can be viewed as modeling yourself as, a, as the adversary and then protecting the user against yourself. And I think what we did with this award and this work was really uh, uh, giving an introduction to this way of thinking of privacy to a wider audience. And I think that might be the most valuable contribution in some sense. I have a, maybe that will be the last question actually. Um, what kind of private metadata was thinking to be added? Like uh, why it was added the possibility of adding private metadata? So that's built the, the paper that uh, Michele and others published at Crypto. So this was more feasibility than uh, something we actually thought of using. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> but you haven't thought like any specific private metadata to that. Okay, yeah. yeah. No. Now, we just, just didn't want just... to fork out too much. So we <laughs> tried to keep the same. Yeah. yeah. Cool, any other last question? I have a quick follow-up question for Alex's question. Thanks, Tara. Um, I was wondering, so uh, related to the uh, the key rotations in the contact tracing app, so are there um, are, are you guys working with the um, developers of that app with any plans to add the public metadata feature to like help with those like um, key rotation and like key transparency concerns? I guess public metadata might be useful for that. Is that right? Right. Um... <clears throat> So the answer is basically no, because they they don't really want to use this app. It's more like something they were forced to do on short notice to kind of help out and that is only going to be used while, while waiting for the pandemic to end, basically, and then move on with our lives. Um, so, so there's not really uh, investing a lot in like making something better than just the first thing that they made run. Um, but I think at least for us, we're going to implement this in our C sharp library, and uh, at least it should be pretty um, well easy in relative terms to kind of implement this into a, a new version of the app in case it's ever needed again later. But it's not something that is actively being worked on from neither our side nor them, as far as I know. But I think it, it should, like, it's a good point. We should definitely, like, now we have solved some problems, maybe we should implement that as well, right? <laughs> cool, thank you. Thanks. Awesome, thank you very much, Siran. Um, so let's move on to the next speaker, which is Nirvan, who was just speaking. He is a PhD candidate at Cornell University, and he's very interested in building distributed systems with um, in regards to providing precise privacy and security properties. 
And today we will be speaking about this idea of how to add public metadata into a BOPF construction to be used by anonymous credentials. So you go, Nick. Okay, thanks, Sophia. Uh, can everyone see the slides here? Yes, Great. we can. Uh, all right, so uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, like Sophia said, I'm Irvan. I'm a PhD student at Cornell, and I'm going to talk about um, uh, some new works on adding public metadata to OPRF evaluations. Um, I'm also currently interning at Facebook this summer, um, where I'm investigating using some of these techniques for, um, for de-identified telemetry. Um, all right, so verifiable OPRFs, uh, excuse me. Uh, verifiable OPRFs have started seeing use in an increasing number of important applications. Um, Alex was talking about some of them as well. Um, and it turns out that many of these applications benefit from um, being able to tie some public metadata into the um, oblivious evaluation of the PRF. And so this can be useful for providing key transparency, token expiration, um, more efficient key management, um, as well as open up uh, new applications. Um, uh, Tehran, I think, talked about some of these in his talk. Um, so I guess for more pointers on like the usefulness of adding public metadata, um, I'd encourage you to, you could take a look at some of the uh, papers that I've linked down here, or I'm happy to chat more about it in uh, the Zulip afterwards or take questions. Um, otherwise, in this talk, um, I'm planning on focusing not on the motivation, but on going over um, two proposed approaches for um, adding public metadata to OPRF evaluation. Um, the first one being uh, partially oblivious PRS, and the second one being attribute-based oblivious PRS. So I'll go over both of these approaches, um, and then I'll show a new construction that achieves both approaches. And this new construction is, um, closely related to the standards track to hash DH OPRF, which many of you uh, may already be familiar with. So that's kind of the roadmap. And um, let's start by maybe quickly reviewing the flow of a regular OPRF evaluation. I know Alex already went over this, so I'll try and be quick. <laughs> uh, so it's an interactive protocol between a client and a server. The server holds the PRF secret key and the client holds the um, some private input uh, along with the PRF public key. Um, the result of the protocol is that the client learns the PRF evaluation um, on its secret input X while the server doesn't learn anything. Um, so the client starts by generating, sending some requests to the server. The server will compute a blinded evaluation on the request and send back a response, which the client will then unblind to receive the final evaluation. Um, and in the case of a verifiable, OPRF, this response will also um, include some proof of correctness that the client can verify with respect to the, um, with the public key. Uh, so are, are there any questions on this flow? Um, okay, sorry, I'm going kind of fast. <laughs> uh, feel free to slow me down. Um, right, so then, so what, what does this flow look like then if we, uh, if we also want to add public metadata to the evaluation. Um, so now the client and server will additionally take as input some public metadata tag T. Um, and the final value learned by the client is the PRF evaluated on um, the combination of the private input X and the public metadata tag T. Um, and so I said there were um, two proposed flows for adding public metadata to OPRF. So First, let's, um, let's look at the partially oblivious PRF. So in a partially oblivious PRF, the flow is actually very similar to a regular OPRF. The client begins by creating some blinded request, um, but then the server's blind evaluation and the client's finalized algorithm will additionally take in this public metadata as um, an additional input. So, um, you can see that this matches very closely with the original OPRF flow, um, just by, uh, except that we're adding in this extra public metadata as inputs um, to the algorithms. 
Um, the second approach, which is attribute-based oblivious paragraphs, um, uh, changes up the flow a little bit more. So in an attribute-based oblivious paragraph, the flow is divided into two phases. Um, so it requires this initial attribute key generation phase that must occur before evaluation. Um, and so in this phase, the server generates an attribute key, uh, which is specific to the metadata um, and provides some proof of correctness for the attribute key in the case of verifiability. Um, so the client can verify that this attribute key is correct with respect to a specific um, piece of metadata and with respect to the protocol public key. And then after this initial attribute key generation phase, um, evaluation kind of proceeds as before. Um, but it's with, um, it's with respect to this new um, attribute public key pair instead of the protocol public key. Um, uh, so what, I guess one thing to note about this flow is that the um, attribute key generation phase only needs to be completed um, once for the client. The client can cache that attribute key and then it can kind of use the attribute key um, on as many evaluations as needed down the line. Um, so are there any high level questions about these two uh, flows for adding public metadata? So there's the POPRF flow and the ABOPRF flow. The AB1 is the Facebook one, right? The one that proposed by Facebook. Right. So the ABOPRF one was originally proposed by this um, uh, de identified authenticated telemetry paper that I have uh, kind of linked at the bottom, um, which was originally. Uh, uh, came out of Facebook, that's right. Uh, okay, cool. So next we'll talk about a, uh, a concrete construction for how to build a POPRF and an ABOPRF. Um, um, so the construction I'll spend the rest of the time talking about um, is called 3Hash SDHI. Uh, and <laughs> we're calling that because of its use of three hash functions and its reliance on the Diffie-Hellman inversion property. Um, and so one way to kind of like um, to parse or, or digest the form of this three hash SDHI PRF is by observing that it, uh, it combines parts of uh, the popular two hash DH P, uh, OPRF and the, uh, the Dodis Yampolsky PRF. Um, so you can see the private client input X, how it's being used in hash uh, uh, three hash SDHI uh, mirrors how it's being used in, um, in the two hash DH OPRF. Um, and so you'll see um, in the next slide or so um, that we'll be using a similar blinding technique as two hash DH um, to blind the client input in three hash SDHI as well. Um, but on the other hand, the inclusion of the public metadata tag T uh, matches that of the Dodis Yampolsky PRF. So we're kind of, we're including it as this um, inverse fraction um, in the exponent, uh, one over SK plus uh, hash of T. Um, right, so that's like the high level intuition behind the, uh, how we constructed this three hash SDHI um, PRF. Um, and so, how to see how it's used, maybe let's first quickly refresh on two hash DH, which again, um, Alex also went over, so I'll try and be quick about this. Um, so in two hash DH uh, in the OPRF evaluation, uh, the public key is some group element and the secret key is the discrete log of that element. Um, the client hashes their input and blinds it using a randomly generated scalar. Um, and then for the blind evaluation, the server will raise the request to the um, power of their secret key. And in the case of verifiability, they'll also provide this discrete log equivalence proof um, that they did that properly. Um, and then the client, uh, the protocol concludes with the client verifying the proof and unblinding the response by um, removing the random scalar R. Um, Great, so uh, next what I'll show is, um, we'll look at the similarities of this protocol with how we can use three hash SDHI as a POPRF. Um, so like recall before there's two ways to add 
um, public metadata to OPRFs. And so let's first look at how we can use 3-hash SDHI as um, a partially oblivious PRF. So the request step follows, and I'll bring back some of the code from the previous slides so that you can compare the um, two approaches. That'll make it easy to see what, kind of what the delta is between the two protocols. Um, so the request step follows exactly as before. We're blinding the input with a random scalar. Um, and really the main difference here is in the blind evaluation. Instead of raising to the power of the secret key, um, the server will instead raise to this power, um, this inverse fraction, one over SK plus T or one over SK plus hash of T. Um, and you can see the two hash DH uh, protocol I included grayed out here, so for comparison purposes. Um, you can also see that the uh, discrete log equivalence proof is modified slightly to capture the inverse exponentiation, re exponentiation relationship instead of just the direct exponentiation relationship that is used in 2 hash DH. And so that involves like swapping some of the elements around. Um, but importantly, um, uh, a single DLEQ proof still suffices. So same as in 2 hash DH. So the efficiency of these two schemes um, is essentially the same. Um, and then the protocol uh, concludes as you'd expect. The client will verify the proof and unblind um, the value to receive the final evaluation. Uh, so the last thing I'll go over is I'll show how 3-hash SDHI can also be used in that second public metadata flow. So 3-hash SDHI um, can also be used as an attribute-based oblivious PRF. And this has some um, unique advantages over a POPRF. Um, so there's some trade-offs here that are kind of interesting. Um, so recall that in an attribute-based OPRF, it kind of gets divided into these two phases. And so this original attribute key generation phase um, actually kind of matches the evaluation protocol of the POPRF. So the um, attribute key is generated as g to the power of this inverse fraction, one over sk plus um, hash of t. And the proof of correctness of the attribute key um, is this like similar like um, inverse exponentiation uh, discrete log equivalence proof. Um, however, like I think the cool part about using three hash SDHI as an uh, ABO PRF is that after this initial attribute key generation phase, the evaluation phase matches exactly that of two hash DH. Um, uh, and so this is kind of a cool property. Uh, it can be used for deployments that wish to use both 2-hash DH um, and support public metadata. Um, yeah, so you can kind of, I won't go into the details here because I'm already, I think, over time, but um, you can see that this uh, evaluation phase is the same exact as 2-hash DH, except we're replacing the protocol public keys with this attribute public keys, which were generated at the, um, in this initial phase. Um, great. So in summary, I, I went over these two newly proposed approaches for adding public metadata to OPRFs. Um, partially oblivious PRFs include the metadata directly as input during the evaluation phase, while uh, attribute-based oblivious PRFs um, require this initial um, metadata-specific key generation phase that must occur before um, evaluation. And then I uh, briefly presented a new construction, 3-hash SDHI, um, that shares many similarities with the standards track 2-hash DH. Um, and it can be used as both a POPRF or an ABOPRF, depending on the deployment setting. So I'll conclude there, um, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Oh, I think you are still muted, Sophia. Oh, yes. <laughs> Thank you very much, Nirwan. That was really amazing work. Um, does someone else, uh, does someone has any question for Nidwa? Oh yes, Alex. <laughs> hey Nidwa, thank you very much. That was really interesting. Um, so the, um, in particular, the like ABOPRF construction um, kind of, it, as you mentioned, fits in with the like two hash DH uh, evaluation. 
And so this, the two hash DH evaluation actually has like this additive blinding mode um, where you can like, instead of raising your hash to the power of R, you can like multiply it with this like G to the power of R instead. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering whether the POPRF version of your protocol has, is able to also have like that, um, like you're also able to blind in an additive way as well as a multiplicative way. Right. Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so I guess I'll first say the good news is that uh, in the, uh, if you use three hash SDHIs in ABOPRF, then since the two hash, since the evaluation matches two hash DH, um, you're able to, I, I presented it as the multiplicative blinding, but you're able to swap in the additive blinding uh, as you'd like here. Um, but with this, regards to your question, additive blinding doesn't work so nicely for the POPRF um, formulation. Um, because um, using additive blinding um, turns out that the client doesn't have the proper group elements to unblind the additive blinding because of the um, of the way of the of the way like the inverse exponent works. Um, the server would also need to send some like essentially the server would need to send that like that attribute specific key that is used in the ABO paragraph. So it needs to send this g to the power of one over s k plus t in order to unblind the additive blinding. Um, so you could do it in POPRF, but it requires sending some extra group elements along. Yeah, that's Thank a good you. question. Thank you. Uh, Martin. Uh, hi. Um, this H3. Um, yes. So we, we, were, we were having a discussion when implementing our version of this, and the students wondered if H3 needed to be uh, uniform uh, onto whatever group uh, it's going into. And uh -huh. I couldn't think of a good reason why, but you assume so in the proof. Did you find uh, a concrete reason to why it had to be uniform or is it more just to make the proof go all nice and tidy? Right, yeah, I think. Um, I don't know if I have a concrete reason. It was, like you say, necessary for the proof because we needed to model it as a um, programmable random oracle for the, um, um, it, it's just an artifact of how do you do some of these like um, Diffie-Hellman inversion proofs. You need to like program ahead of time um, what values you think will be uh, requested in the inversion. And so by including the hash, then we can kind of, even if we don't know exactly what public metadata tags the adversary will query, we can kind of program them ahead of time to what values you want to output from the random oracle. So I would say it's an artifact for proof. I don't have any concrete reason for. Yeah, we were able unable to find a good. Uh, well, we weren't unable to find an attack basically, but and my intuition said, well, it shouldn't matter since uh, a reasonable set of T's is is so small that the actual image of the hash function would be small, but still, right. yeah. Yeah, that there's also, interesting. yeah. If you, if you are working with a very small um, subspace of Ts, of public metadata tags, um, then you can avoid the hash completely as well. Sorry, you said? If the tag space, if this public metadata space is over some like small um, byte space, for instance, like maybe like, eight bits or something like that, um, then um, you could do an alternative proof strategy that avoids the, the hash function there. Right. Well, thanks. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for the question. Thank you very much, Nirvan. Any other wondering question or comment? I guess not. <laughs> so thank you very much, Nirvan. Um, as always, awesome way. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Um, could you stop sharing the screen, Ivan? Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, okay. So the last presentation, I actually have to make it. Um, let me try to do it. Okay. Let's do this first. View file. Okay. Uh, hopefully. Oh, 
failed, the screen has failed to start. Okay, nice. I just touch a Zoom bug. Okay. Okay, are you able to see my screen? Yes, I assume so. Okay, so hi everyone. Um, the last presentation that we wanted to give is just a little bit of an update of some idea that we had on the previous anonymous credential meeting and kind of show you the result. Because the ideas of this meeting is also to come with ideas together or avenues to be starting working on. Um, and this was actually one of them. So this was the idea of the token so which is this website you can find in that URL. And this was an idea first proposed by, or first kind of scoped by George Kadianakis from the Tool Project. And later it was taken into a more live form <laughs> by Michelle Oru, by George Kadianakis, by Alex Davidson, by Chris Wood, uh, by myself. Uh, today, George couldn't be here because I wanted him to kind of give an overview, um, but he, um, it was kind of decided I could give the presentation. So what is the idea of this website? It's basically, so where does the idea come from? As I already said, this was kind of the outputs of the Rio World Crypto 2021 meeting that we had. Um, and the idea was that when one is trying to implement or one to use anonymous credentials, there's not a good place in which one can actually learn all the security properties that they give or whatever schemes are available, a scheme slash protocols are available that you can be using to your application or into your protocol, whatever you need them in practice. So we try to create this website as this place where people can go and actually find this information. Another thing that we highly discussed on the last this meeting was that sometimes some of the security or PVC properties that are defined in several anonymous credential papers are kind of repeated, but, but with different names um, or, what is like, or with slight tweaks. So we wanted to have a place where all of these properties actually match to what they are referring to. And as I said, the idea of this unifying place for anonymous credentials on the properties was first proposed by George Kadianakis. Um, so what is basically it is basically a taxonomy of credentials and on the website you're going to find several different uh, places of it. You're going to find the schemes, you're going to find the properties, you're going to find the protocols and you're going to find some explanations around it. It's still a very much work in progress. So if you want to contribute to them and make them nicer, please do so. Because um, it will really, really be really, really nice to have a place where people can actually refer and know how to properly use them. Even adding a section, for example, on what implementation pitfalls are there when um, dealing with anonymous credentials would be good because that will guide implementers into a much better place. Uh, yeah, that was kind of basically all. So how can you can help? You can help us to build more of this website. It's basically hosts over GitHub. So if you're interested, go to it, send a PR, or we also have a Slack channel over this Crypto Meets Western um, group that there exists on a Slack. Um, so if you're interested, you can join. One of the ideas also of the latest meeting was basically if you're interested in actually identifying correctly what kind of properties the different anonymous credentials schemes give, it will be uh, something interesting to actually create a SOC of all of them and properly define the properties and how all of the proposed schemes out there um, achieve these properties or if they don't achieve these properties. And just as some ideas, so maybe you keep the discussion if you want to collaborate a little bit more between each other um, after this meeting. Um, some things that I'm still wondering is what kind of the other application of anonymous credentials are there. I really loved the presentation by Tiran because he showed yet another <laughs> application uh, to a ticketing system of anonymous credentials. There's some people that currently are thinking of how to add anonymous credentials to a secure messaging system in order to prevent DDoS attacks, for example can be also a cool application, but this is kind of a construction that could be applicable to many places. So start thinking about all of those places might be nice. And something that is still the wondering question that we always have when trying to standardize this protocol or to think about this protocol is what are the actual implementation pitfalls for them? I already know some of them <laughs> that are like kind of double spending projection, key rotation, uh, periodicity. Um, when does the key has to be uh, rotated? What kind of metadata can actually be added that did not diminish the anonymity set? Um, or from a more theoretical perspective, what would be a good way to add um, any kind of unbounded private metadata if you really want to do so? So this was just to kind of get the ball rolling if people want to discuss or actually start um, thinking about that. Another question that I'm also really deeply interested in is, of course, the post-quantum and anonymous credentials. 
because I would like a really good and efficient scheme of that. But yeah, let's see. But yeah, that's all that I had at least for this. So if you're interested, please ping us up in the Sulip and we will try to add you to the Slack or we will try to add you to the repository if you're interested in helping into this effort. And that's all.